few minutes, you're going to have the opportunity to hear from some of our directors about poverty simulations, which, as you've already heard, is a really important tool in our effort to educate the community about poverty. We at NISCA have facilitated a number of poverty simulations, both during the poverty tour and outside of the tour, as an effort to uh, provide professional training to folks who are our service providers and human services agencies, to uh, increase people's awareness about the uh, extent and severity of poverty in our communities, to dispel some of the harmful myths about low-income people and low-income communities, um, and to do so in a way that gives people the opportunity to really walk in the shoes of of both people who are, are living in poverty and those community service providers who are trying to serve those folks. Um, it is a really powerful experience. Uh, having been part of numerous poverty simulations, from very small ones to very large ones, each one is a really unique experience, but each one packs a really powerful punch. You walk away feeling that you really have walked in the shoes of somebody who has lived that experience. Um, so it really is an intense, um, effective way to change one's perspective. Um, and even people who work in, in poverty services, people who have lived in poverty, walk away learning something about themselves, about their community, about poverty. We've been able to conduct poverty simulations for school districts, community action staff and board, um, elected officials. We were thrilled to do a poverty simulation for the Department of, of State staff, um, community leaders, and the feedback each and every time has been really positive and has really reinforced the importance of using this tool. Um, so we hope over the next few minutes you'll get a sense of what poverty simulations look like, um, how they've been used by our agencies and our directors, and have a sense as to whether or not this is a tool that would be useful in your community. If you're interested in learning more about poverty simulations or perhaps uh, facilitating one in your community, please feel free to either call your local community action agency or call us at NISCA. I want to thank Veronica Cruz for being willing to participate in today's event and for talking a little bit about her experiences with poverty simulations. My name is Veronica Cruz and I am the New York State Director of the Division of Community Services for the Department of State. I uh, had the fortune of participating in the poverty tour and I can't, uh, there wasn't a stop I didn't enjoy. But one of the things that I did as well was participate in poverty, in the poverty simulations. I didn't know what to expect when I attended my first one. I thought it's a game, clearly I've got to win it. And I think a lot of people think that when they think it's a simulation, it's a process that you can win or you can lose and clearly you want to be on the winning side. But it's much more interesting and much more complex than just a normal board game. And what you leave with is as valuable as the part that you participate in. One, the three things that I left with was one, the opportunity to experience poverty. And that's one of its values. And that it gives people who don't live in poverty an opportunity to experience the vulnerabilities, the consequences, the loss of possibility that comes with being in poverty. Because that's when you really begin to realize it's not a game that you can win. That it's a game of, it's, it's a consequence with many complexities. And so its value and that it gives people the opportunity to experience that is incredible. It gives our agencies too the opportunity to use it as a tool to expand that uh, beyond its own community. The second thing was that you saw for people who came from poverty, who've experienced poverty, you see how they are able then to see other people. And they look at them and they go, wait a minute, you're not any better at this than I was when I experienced it. But you should be, because you have more money, maybe you have a better education, maybe you have the appearance of success. And yet, you look as lost as I did when I was living in poverty. And so it can be reinforcing in that sense for people to see, for people who come and have experienced deep poverty. From my perspective, from a policy perspective, what it did for me, which is ultimately uh, my greatest lesson, is that it said to me that the Community Action Network is so important to us because when you're in trouble, you have a door to open. You, there's a place for you to go to say, I gotta go see Juanita, because she's gonna know how to help me. And that worker is gonna be right there in your local community action agency. And you're gonna be able to have a place 
where you can say, this is what I'm dealing with right now. And hopefully, where that takes you to is through the transition that is poverty for most people in this country. More importantly, though, I'd like to hear what other people think about the simulation. And I'm interested in what they thought and what they think the value is of this exercise. The major focus of the tour stop was a simulation, and it was the first time our agency had ever hosted a poverty simulation. First time personally I had been involved in one, and uh, we had really positive feedback from both our staff who served as the community agency uh, staff in the simulation and from folks who were participants. Uh, we had everything from board members to uh, funders, United Way, community foundation folks. What we decided to do though was to make sure that we were inviting again people that would not ordinarily have been the group that we would have reached out to for this. Uh, we tried to focus on uh, some of our elected officials, we focused uh, a good bit on the school systems and, and just other community partners, business people that we had uh, and maybe didn't have uh, really solid relationships with. And it wasn't just service providers. We had members of our local government, our chief from the fire department, um, individuals that I thought would not participate, um, participated. And um, they were very moved by the event. We had a lot of um, discussion afterwards, um, so it, it was extremely beneficial. And then there was also, I thought was interesting, a whole class of nursing students from another local college that came and participated. And there was some profound comments at the conclusion of that simulation about, I, you know, I just, I never really stopped and thought about how difficult it was to manage all of those things every day in life and, and get your family through it and then conversations about the impact on the children and how that really added such a huge level of stress to the children as well. Like I said earlier, we, we had a little bit of a challenge getting people to the simulation. Not, I think folks didn't really have an idea what it was. Um, now that we've done it, we've had positive feedback and I think we would have an easier time you know, getting folks there next year if we do it again. It was interesting to see the dynamics that work among the various folks who participated in the group because you see, uh, you could see up close and personal that really they, many of them had no idea what um, folks who are living in poverty have to go through on a daily basis just to survive or, or get needed services. And it created a, just an environment and an atmosphere which was wonderful because it, you could see that in the look in the eyes of the folks who were participating uh, that they were awakened. And that was the whole uh, goal or desire that we had in, in engaging in a poverty simulation like that so that people's consciousness would be reawakened or awakened and they would come back to or, or get the reality of knowing what their neighbors are living in. For groups like that, you know, you'd like to think that they, they have an understanding of what their families are facing and the challenges families face every day, but in reality, I don't know that they, they really do. They, they're very focused on education, which is their job. But they also need to understand what's going on at the family level so that they can best help the children that, that they're teaching. I am still, when I do things in the community, I'm still hearing from people who were either a part of that or who have talked to people who are a part of that. Um, and, and I've had people that, again, weren't, weren't individuals in the community that we were necessarily well connected with who have called me to say, you know, I appreciate the opportunity. It has sensitized me and opened my 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 way of thinking and my way of looking at people in the community in, in a way that, that I wasn't even really expecting. I got an email a couple days later from a staffer at the Park Foundation saying that she had just received an application for funding and they quoted being in the poverty simulation at the tour stop in Tompkins County and that it had changed the way that they looked at poverty and it changed the way and that this was the reason that they were asking for this money. The feedback that we received from that uh, was amazing. Several um, participants stated they had been in the um, human services field for um, 
some of them decades, along with the educational field, and um, they had no idea what people experienced, um, and that they took a, you know, walked away with a whole different outlook on um, the person sitting across from them, or the child in the classroom, or even the mother of the child. Our local United Way president uses his experience as a homeless person or simulation as he talks to groups about the importance of donating to United Way and how he, no matter what he did and how he tried, the system itself really was difficult for him to maneuver with everything that he already knew going in. So imagine what it's like for families. So that was phenomenal as well. Just the feedback from the poverty simulation itself has been, I just heard last week, it changed my life forever and how I look at things. Result of that, we had you know more communication from some school districts that came out and wanted to know what they could do, how they could learn more, and the schools are are the central focus and the hub of every community. No matter how big your city or small your town, I mean that's something that every community has in common, and it's also something at least for us that we have been able to um, to identify again. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can help a child, and if we're able to help a child, it helps and strengthens the family. So it's, it's part of, uh, of the broader process for us. We recognize that teachers, um, you know, think about it, that nobody spends time, more time over the course of a day or a week with a child uh, than their teacher apart from their parents. So this is a person who is such a critical part of this child's life understanding the challenges that that family's facing when they leave their classroom is absolutely critical. Um, so again, the poverty simulation, uh, we have found, uh, we've been able to do that with a couple of the schools in our area. As a result of the poverty tour, um, the, the poverty simulation that we had, there were three um, super, school superintendents there from, again, uh, other districts in our community, and all three of them have reached out to say, we want you to do this for our entire staff, not just for, you know, one component. They want their entire staff to be able to participate in it. We keep hearing more and more from folks. We just. We're at a meeting and a principal, we're talking about um, pathways to school readiness. And a principal said, because one principal said, well, I don't understand, the kid needs glasses. Why is the child not bringing the glasses? I know they have three pairs of glasses. The parents just, you know, lack of a better word, it wasn't, you know, not paying attention. Well, another principal spoke up and said, I thought that same way, but a few weeks ago, ProAction came in and gave a poverty simulation to my school district and I have a whole new perspective, so I recommend that school districts do it. So that was phenomenal for us. It's like that chill that moves over your body. Somebody's listening, somebody's getting it. And we all that owe all of it to the tour. If the tour didn't come and we didn't have that opportunity, it wouldn't have happened for us. Our community is in your debt. <laughs> Our phones are ringing off the hook because what schools are realizing is they need the support. They need to understand poverty in order to help move um, the needle for these youth in getting their homework done and meeting the obligations that are being passed down by the state. So they're actually inviting us into their schools and into their meetings with the parents and the youth to have these conversations.